feel like I'm an inspirational speaker right now, right? <laughs> Gather around. Ask our speakers as well to come up to the podium. Are you a walker or a sitter in general in your school? Either. Either? Okay. Please come up. No, 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 no. You don't have <laughs> That would be an interesting sort of dynamic. Hi. Please, please. We have individual mics for everyone. So good evening, everyone, on this nice spring day in downtown Riverside. It's wonderful to see you all and wonderful to kick off the first reimagined Chaz Dean's inaugural lecture series uh, with one of our own, Simon Tam, uh, a former student. Simon and I were just talking about his studies, well, his longer educational journey, but including his studies in, in Chaz. Uh, when he started in 2001, so I got that right, uh, and before going on to some great things, which we'll be learning about over the next two days, uh, in Portland and in Washington, D.C., and now you live in Cincinnati, exactly, so I was about to say Cleveland, but you're going to be, soon you're going to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? That's the Cleveland part, right? <laughs> so it's great to see you. Hi, Beth. Good to see you. Beth is probably a future Highlander as well. So, um, I want to admit, I want to um, invite everyone to not just gather around here, uh, but also to think not just those of you who are present physically here at UCR Arts, but those of you who are also joining us through our UCR YouTube. Um, thank you again for joining us. I want a special shout out to a couple organizations, the Young Oak Chem, Young Oak Chem Center, and we have our director here uh, with that, Asian Pacific Student Programs, Save Our Chinatown Committee, and the Rod House Foundation, and of course, everyone here at UCR Arts and everyone in the marketing, communication, and events team and facilities team as well uh, in chess. So we have some panelists. I'll do a brief introduction, and then we'll get right to some questions. So um, in the order that I have in my list here, we have Christine Victorino, who's right here, uh, our associate chan chancellor who's Chief of Staff uh, to Chancellor Kim Wilcox. Dr. Victorino serves as a Principal Advisor to University Leadership and plays a key role in developing and executing UCR's strategic vision and goals, as well as uh, various kinds of initiatives and liaison work, especially with the Board of Regents. She co-leads the University Anna Pizzi, which is Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander Serving Institutions Committee, along with Vice Chancellor uh, Miriam Lamb. So thank you, Christine. Uh, Dr. Ed Chang here, Professor of Ethnic Studies. Dr. Chang is the founding director of the Young Oak Chem Center for Korean American Studies. Professor of uh, Ethnic Studies is a pro prolific researcher, published many books, including the one uh, that had a direct UCR arts connection, Pachapa Camp, the first Korea town in the United States, which has received uh, significant support from the Mellon Foundation to share the history of America's first Korea town, which was discovered here in Riverside through a national traveling exhibition, which begins in 2024. Yes, 2024. It's right here in Riverside to the world. And then we have William or, or Billy uh, Sapanap, uh, Kaganap, right? Kaganap, I'm sorry, Kaganap. Uh, Billy serves as director of UCR's Asian Pacific Students Program, which is a community of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander students, staff, interns, peer mentors, uh, de dedicated to preserving and promoting the rich cultural fabric of diversity at UCR. He earned his dual degrees in Asian American Studies and Social Sciences from UC Irvine, our ca sister campus, and an MA in Higher Education Administration from NYU. And if I think I heard it correctly, you've been with campus and Asian student programs for 20 years, 20 years, so fantastic. And then Simon Tan, um, he's an author, musician, activist, self-proclaimed troublemaker, a Highlander as well, uh, who's best known as the founding, founder and bassist for Asian American dance rock band known as The Slants. Simon approaches art and activism with radical optimism and compassion. And he's also uh, the lead on a landmark case that went before the United States Supreme Court in 2017, for the Formal Day in 2017, which helped expand civil liberties for marginalized groups. Uh, it's been 
on lots of different media uh, out platforms and outlets, and we're going to see a little bit more of his talents and works uh, tomorrow. Uh, but um, he also has worked in the philanthropic, philanthropic space here with something called uh, an organization called the Slants Foundation, which is a nonprofit that is pushing the boundaries of what is possible in art, activism, and civic engagement. So these are our speakers. Um, I have some questions for them, some leading questions, and then uh, we'll open it up to the questions from you all as well. So that being said, I want to dive right in um, and ask your thoughts. You were at a very highly unsettled and charged moment in Asian American inclusion in the United States in particular. We have gains and presence of Asian Americans in voting politics, in entrepreneurialism, in media representation, Oscars, among others. Uh, but we also know it's a time of intense disruption and upset and bias and hate. And so what are you hearing right now in your local communities about this unsettled time for Asian Americans in the United States? Why don't we ask Dr. Chang, Ed, first to give us some thoughts. I know this, everyone's mic on? Yeah, this, this oh, one yeah, work. You can pass it back. Okay. Well, uh, I guess uh, all of you know that for the past three years in particular, uh, the anti-Asian hate and violence have increased dramatically, not only in Southern California, but you know, all over the country. And I, you know, I tell my students that you know, former President Donald Trump is one of the main culprit. Uh, he, he called uh, COVID-19 as China virus, a Kung flu, every time he had the opportunity to speak with media. So he was actually inciting anti-Asian hate as a president of the United States, which is very unfortunate, but you know, that really led to uh, many uh, violence and even killing uh, in Atlanta eight Asian American women were killed uh, be simply because they happen to be Asian American. So, you know, a lot of it, particularly a lot of elderly and women feel they're unsafe to walk around the, you know, K-Town, Chinatown, Manila Town, whatever. So hopefully things are coming down, but uh, over the last three years it's been really ordeal for Asian American community, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think to, to build upon that, there's, I think this is not the first time our communities have experienced anything like this. I, I think, uh, if anything, U.S. history has shown is that there's been a lot of antagonism towards communities of color and, and to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I mean, you know, the, the largest, um, hanging and, and lynching in the country is, was uh, outside of a Chinatown. Uh, and, and violence is, is not something that is new to us, but I think one thing that gives me a lot of uh, hope for the moment, and, and it's a really wonderful thing to show how things can even thrive in times of darkness, is now other folks are allying up and bringing more attention to these causes. Um, there's more uh, interracial solidarity, and there's arts coming from the Asian American community that is thriving, and and also I think bringing more nuanced stories of, of compassion and hope, and and that's what gives me a lot of um, uh, of my own uh, um, optimism about this moment. Is that it, you know even though we're experiencing a lot of trauma as a community, we're also seeing uh, you know for the first time ever uh, U U.S. Congress den denouncing. Uh, hate crimes against the Asian American community. We're seeing uh, policies in being passed to try and desegregate uh, da data about a AAPIs. We're, we're seeing tracking of, of these incidents, and that's leading to uh, policies being passed around the country. Um, something that I didn't think, you know, someone who's grown up who was also attacked violently as a kid, uh, I didn't think that was something I would see in my lifetime. And now here we are in this moment with people organizing and getting. Uh, support. So I think um, it's a moment of transition, and, and I think this is where we really have to seize upon those opportunities to 
to make those institutional changes that, that can last. And, and on that, uh, I think just the, the student movement, uh, it's just the, even the creation of, of the office that I work in, so a Asian Pacific Student Programs, was created by a student movement. Uh, you know, there was an incident on UCR's campus uh, involving an Asian student back in the late 80s. Uh, the students then mobilized and uh, demanded that there be a uh, Asian American office on campus. Uh, and through that, a a APSP was formed. Uh, the, the students were able to get two Asian American faculty members hired on campus, one of them being Ed Chang. Uh, so I think with the, when these types of incidents happen, it's, it's the youth really that, that are the ones that kind of push the push us forward and, and they're the ones that are the ones that are making that change and and I think for certain groups it's it's scary that you know the youth have are able to communicate with each other you know through social media and to to kind of mobilize uh, cross cross boundaries really to 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 start creating this this movement this change to address a lot of these issues that, that we are seeing in our community. Uh, so we see it in our office, we, we have students who are v actively involved uh, and they can be involved from across the country. You know, it, it's, it's very different than when I first started, you know, where 20 years ago, it, things were very regional and, and if something happened across the country, you know, people in California or, or Riverside specifically wouldn't be able to be involved. But now, you know, through, you know, Instagram, through Twitter, through all the social media accounts, people are able to make an impact, you know, with whatever's going on across the country, across the globe, you know, things that are going on in Asia, our students are, are very involved with. So, so I think that's, that's what we're seeing, and, and hopefully, because of that, you know, we, we can address a lot of the, the anti-AAPI hate that, that really spiked during uh, the early times of the pandemic, and, and hopefully, you know, like Dr. Chang was saying, is it, hopefully it's kind of uh, lessening, but you know, it, it's been around you know, e even before, uh, before the pandemic. So it's, it's not necessarily something new, but you know, again, social media and everything is able to exemplify it and, or amplify it and, and uh, you know, hopefully our students step up and, and make that impact and make that change. Okay, I think we already talked about some of the negative things that have happened in the last few years, but um, how have we been turning that into more positives? I think what we, what we realized during the pandemic, post-pandemic, is that the Asian American AAPI community is still really invisible. Uh, people feel as though um, there's such a large and amorphous group that they don't complain. There's also this model minority myth, they don't need support. Um, and I think what we're realizing is that, you know, we don't have um, a collective voice and that we don't typically have these platforms to build community. So I'm really thankful to the CHAS team and Dean Williams for putting together this event and for all of you for coming after hours. It's really hard to get people to come to events after hours. Um, really to talk about these issues, bring visibility to them, and to develop community. I think there are some original staff and faculty members who are really active on our campus, you know, more than a decade ago to build this Asian American AAPI community on campus, and it kind of fell by the wayside. So when Vice Chancellor Miriam Lam said, maybe we should have an Asian American Native Pacific Islander serving institution committee for the campus, I said, absolutely, let's do it. Um, we have a Chicano Latino advisory group, we have um, an African American community advisory group, and those groups have been uh, foundational to UCR's identity, and they have been strong advisors to the chancellor and to the community, alumni engagement and so forth, and um, this moment that we're in has really um, revitalize that feeling of having to build a sense of community, um, bringing visibility to issues, whether um, it's hate or racial bias or um, the number of students on our Asian American students who are undocumented on our campus, the um, graduation and equity gaps among different groups, specifically Pacific Islanders and Hmong students. And so 
With UCR, you know, sort of situated as this national exemplar for diversity, not to have um, a collective community around Asian American Pacific Islander um, identity, it, it's kind of really unfortunate. So um, it's, you know, leadership and sort of some, some of the stalwarts on campus are really working hard to build that back up. And when we brought, came together as a community, we came up with dozens of ideas on how to help students, how to mentor staff and faculty, how to do outreach in the community to get more undergraduates, transfer students, graduate students from all, from all Asian and Pacific Islander uh, races and ethnicities, which comprise at least 80 different ethnic groups and hundreds of languages and dialects, and how do we build more visibility, build community, and develop a collective voice, I think is what we're trying to do. So just kind of switching the narrative there. Thank you. So I'm gonna ask um, Ed to comment on some of the historical uh, weight, the burdens, but the historical trajectories that we're, we're, we're living at this moment. So here we think about what Christina shared with us was taking place at UCR right now, and I think we're at what, 22 or 23 percent Asian American at UCR, but we know the history of the University of California would never imagine that any campus on the original University of California would have that number. I mean, this is a period in which Chinese exclusion acts and things like this were very much a part of California's legal uh, system as well as the aspiration for what the kind of state California would be. So Ed, talk to us some about this long history no of anti-Asian exclusion and discrimination and hate in California, and these moments of inflection where that becomes incredibly intense, but also when it opens up and it creates some of the possibilities at one of the flagship campuses that we have here at UCR. To talk about, as Christine shared with us, some hopeful, if also challenging, sort of developments in our state and its, and its history. Yeah, unfortunately, California is, was, used to be a leading state uh, uh, charging against Asian, uh, Chinese immigration. Uh, one of the first thing that labor union movement in California uh, did was Chinese must go. It was their platform. And appealing white nationalist ideology to mobilize white labor and uh, at the expense of Chinese workers, Chinese immigrants. And directly led to passage of Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And later on, uh, Japanese and the Korean uh, Filipinos were targeted. And we have a Harada house uh, and directly connected to alien land law of 1913, which prohibited aliens ineligible to become citizens from owning and leasing land in California. And there were numerous examples of anti-Asian uh, violence, hate, exclusion, regulation, whatnot. Uh, but you know it, that continued until 1950s and the 60s, and finally, with civil rights movement and the Asian American movement, uh, ro rose in 1968 with uh, San Francisco State University strike. Uh, many Asian American students participated in it, along with black students, uh, Native American students, and Chicano students. Uh, you know, University of California used to be mostly a white institution until 1980s. I, I remember I was the student at Cal Berkeley in 1980, and Asian American students were a very small percentage back then. And uh, Berkeley tried to limit the number of Asian American students because you know, alumni was alarmed with the increasing number of Asian American students. So what they have done was they decided to institute illegal admission policy, which set a uh, minimum number of uh, math school and minimum number of uh, English school. But they said some students must have a minimum English school in order to enter the University of California, which later on uh, was determined as an unconstitutional uh, admission policy. So now, after that, Berkeley began to accept a larger number of Asian American students. And uh, com coming back to UCR, you know, like you know, Billy said, I was hired as a first Asian American professor 
Uh, I taught uh, Asian American Studies class in 1992, and it's my 34th year. It's in time flies, hey. but uh, and so uh, and uh, UCR has grown. When I first came here, we were only 8,000 students. Now we are close to 26, 7,000. You know, 26, 26. yeah. So it's about three times more than three times bigger than 1992. So, you know, through, you know, new leadership, Dean and many others, Christine, uh, I think th things are moving along. Hopefully, uh, we become more visible and we become more uh, accountable to the community. And that's what we are trying to do. And one of my research projects, Pachapa Camp, is gaining uh, local and national attention. So I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to take the story, locally based, Riverside story, to national and maybe international arena. Thank you. So Billy, when you think about the students that you're working with right now, what are they demanding for? What actionable um, calls, demands, aspirations, like on the ground now, to address inclusion and opportunity, but also to respond to hate, bias, historical, contemporary, what some people also fear and we imagine might continue if certain measures aren't taken? I think it's really hard to say uh, because for our students, just the student population in general, uh, AAPI is, is so broad. Uh, we have a lot of students who are on campus who are part of that AAPI community who don't necessarily uh, identify as AAPI. Well, they identify, but not really choose it as their, not that they don't choose their identity, but they're not in, invested in the, uh, in the issues that are affecting the AAPI, AAPI community. A lot, of, a lot of students, and I think this is maybe a cultural thing where AAPI students come to college and, you know, be it the pressures from parents or you know, family to, their number one goal is, I need to graduate. Like, I, let me focus on uh, getting my degree. I'll go to class, I'll do the papers, I'll do these presentations, but, you know, if, if there's a protest, you know, for whatever reason, you know, they, if, if you speak to, to a lot of the students that, that I, I see, they'll say, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm behind this, I'm, you know, I'm all for supporting this protest. Let me send out a tweet or let me, let me post this on my Instagram that I support this protest. Uh, so it's, it's uh, it, again, uh, I've been here 20 years, so when I first started, or going back to when I was a student at uh, UC Irvine, and so this mid-90s, it was very common for the students to, to really mobilize and kind of be out there and you know, storm the chancellor's office or, or do, do things like that where, where we say, this is what we want, this is what we need, we, we need to see these changes, I, I think now, uh, and maybe the, the most uh, impactful moment or the, the opportunity to, to see if our students would support or would be out there in a protest happened in the middle of a pandemic. You know, it was uh, June 1st, 2020, with, with all the uh, uh, Black Lives Matters protests and, and, and whatnot. And so you would see, again, on their uh, social media that they were supporting it, but it, would that have translated if we were in person? You know, would they have been at the bell tower marching with, with other communities? I, I honestly don't know, and, and it, it's really hard to, we definitely do have a segment of our student population who I know for sure would have been out there. And then we have a lot of students who, you know, you know they are the, the keyboard activists is, is what they call them. And then we have students who really don't know what's happening except for, I have this midterm next week, let me focus on this midterm. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really hard to say um, if there's anything that the students are really pushing for. I know during the, when we were online and the AAPI or anti-AAPI hate incidents were happening, they were like, all right, let's, Let's put together some programs, and again, it, it was online, so we were on Zoom, and all the students seemed, all right, let's, you know, we need to address this, we need to talk about this, and our first event, we had uh, 30 to 40 people on a Zoom meeting. I was like, oh, this is great. Maybe five were students. The rest were faculty and staff on, on campus, so it, 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 it's, it's hit or miss, uh, and 
it's really hard to gauge where the students are and what will get them to go out there. And for, for many of our students, sending out that, that social media message, to them that might be equivalent to what we were doing when we were marching uh, you know, back in the mid-90s. So for them, that might be putting themselves out there or uh, you know, protesting as they understand what protesting is. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it's a hard question to answer because I don't know if there is a single thing that they're demanding and depending on which community you're looking at, uh, different communities are looking for different things. So, What's your biggest, um, in terms of uh, student-led demand right now, what's the kind of rises up, whether it's from a particular group or whether it's across, you know, the ones that you're losing some sleep over, but also saying if and how we can address this, we can make educational opportunity, social experience, personal safety better. I think it's, it goes back to uh, maybe the, it, it's, it's the groups that are, I guess, underrepresented, uh, the groups that are, are uh, it's our Pacific Islanders, our Southeast Asians who, you know, when you talk about the model of minority myth, they're the ones who are most affected, uh, negatively affected by that model minority myth. They're the ones who, when people talk about how great APIs are doing uh, in school, in, in the workforce and, and whatnot, they're the ones that are kind of ignored and the, the aren't brought to the, uh, to the forefront as not receiving as much resources. They're, they're the ones who you know, are dropping out at a higher rate than um, most other uh, ethnic groups or when it comes to you know, poverty line uh, uh, numbers, you know, they're the ones who aren't doing as well or you know, are not even uh, at the, the medium income type of thing. So, so I, I think that's where, uh, in terms of trying to uh, address what issues our students are looking for, those are the students I think we need to target and hopefully what Christine was saying. That with Christine. So let's um, shift the conversation a little bit and turn to Simon and uh, make the, so I'll make an observation here that Asian American and the art forms of punk or rock do not necessarily make for easy or familiar pairings, but yet you bring them together. And so could you talk to us about how your chosen art form or forms have played a significant part in your experience as a self-identified Asian American? I think for me, I mean, I kind of fell into punk music when I was in high school, uh, you know, starting with like going to local shows and the Ramones and that sort of thing. And perhaps the thing that I identified the most, um, you know, I liked the music, it seemed very approachable, three chords, anyone could do it kind of thing. But more importantly, I love the spirit behind the music. And I, I oftentimes say punk rock is not a genre of music, it's a form of expression. It's a, it's a certain attitude of um, almost defiance, of like being refused to be uh, put in a box or uh, to have someone else choose your identity for you. And there was something that was very powerful about that, uh, particularly as I was growing up and oftentimes put in a box. Uh, either from other students or from teachers. Like, I mean, I remember my, my big frustration was I, I loved uh, English, I loved literature, but my teachers never called on me. And, the, and in math class, they would call on me all the time, even though I sucked at math. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, I just, just grappling with that. And, and I just, I, so I, it really resonated with me. And I think that, there's actually a, a very large segment of, of Asian Americans who kind of grew up around the same time period who also feel very similar, like um, who's who you know. They're, so so I think it's it's a little bit in our DNA because we we understand the sentiment of that. And then when I had a chance to, to jump into music and 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 create, I, I wanted to carry that spirit with me. And so, for example, the, the slants, we don't play punk music, but people oftentimes call us a punk band because of the spirit in which we uh, approach our work. And so I think that's, that's a lot of it. And I think uh, to kind of Billy's point, it's just like, um, it's also up against these other notions about 
what people have just as us being Asian Americans. So we're like, we're not a monolithic group. Uh, you know, our, our band members comprise many different identities under the diaspora from, from Vietnam to Taiwan to China to Korea and so on. And, and, and it's like, we each had very unique experiences. We have different cultures and languages, but the one thing that we do share is what it's like to, to grow up here under um, institutions that oftentimes have uh, elements of white supremacy threaded in. And so I, I didn't start the band as a social political project per se. I, I just wanted to provide representation and uh, hang out with a bunch of people without having to drag a bunch of footnotes and explain like who I was. I didn't think about it at the time uh, but the very act of creating an Asian American and Pacific Islander band was a form of activism. And I think that's actually what set me off on a journey uh, and, and a journey of identity and expression. And so um, kind of come full circle, it, like I think maybe that was the most punk thing about that whole experience. All right. So uh, in an earlier conversation, we were talking about, and even today, you were talking about um, the touring that you've done, the various venues, and the various countries that you've been to uh, uh, as part of the performing for the slants, and talking specifically about some unusual experiences you had, particularly in Asia. You, I think you mentioned in Japan, but earlier we were also talking about you were in... Uh, in uh, Taiwan. Taiwan yeah. as well, yes. So talk about that. Uh, share a little bit more with this group, uh, you know, that how your identities and experiences as Asian Americans in a sort of legible way, some of punk way in touring in the United States was disrupted, changed, maybe reinforced when you were in, in Asia and what you make of all that yeah, as a musician, so, as, a, as, a, as a citizen, et cetera. Uh, so, so for us, uh, when we were here, whenever we were touring in America, we are known as the Asian American band or to some promoters, we are just the Asian band. And, they would, whatever band from Asia was touring uh, at the time in Portland, uh, we would be asked to perform with them, whether it was K-pop to metal to, to whatever. And they're like, well, you know, they're from Japan or they're from Korea. Like, maybe we're like, no, we all grew up here. But, you know, if it was a band we liked, we would take the show. <laughs> uh, but uh, so th that was like the, our experience here. When we went to tour Asia, we were not the Asian band we were the American band. And we're like, no, we're like, you know, my, my, my guitarist is born in China, and they're like, you're not one of us. <laughs> so they always saw us as, as the, the American band, and it was just so interesting, uh, because like, even though we, we had a shared cultural heritage, they, could, they like, could tell us from like, just looking at us that we weren't uh, that, that exactly like them. And, uh, even like when we had conversations about, and they're like, well, what's so special about an Asian American band? Like, we're all Asian here. It, we're like, that's not how it is. It, like, we're treated differently. And they, it just was like, it blew their minds, like that, that we would be treated differently or special or worse because of our, our identities. Because when you're part of the dominant group, you're just invisible to those experiences. And, and I think that um, it was just a really fun and different way to experience our identity in a part of a country where, or a part of the world where now it's not a novel thing, but it's the norm. And now we're actually outsiders, even in our own respective countries that our, our families come from. So here's maybe a challenging question for you, but did you ever sometimes um, do or find yourself in a moment of reflection about United States relationships to Asia, militarism, uh, racism, you know, and, and feeling what role, what place you have in that? I, I would say it's, um, it's sometimes challenging. I, I think at the time um, when we were touring Asia, the, the, the politics around it were a little bit more friendly. But I, I think there's a long history of sometimes feeling a bit of antagonism. Uh, so for me, who, um, you know, half my family is Taiwanese, the other half is Chinese that brings up a lot of tough political conversations, it, whether I'm in China or Taiwan, because of uh, the, you know, the Taiwanese, like particularly my, my islander part of my family, they were like, we're not Chinese. We are not Chinese. We, we are our own nation. We are like, we have our own identity. And whereas China thinks that's just a bunch of rebels that need to be put down. And, and 
you know. So I think the tension af oftentimes, f as, as me growing up in America, in a democracy, and, and, and seeing how people can kind of choose uh, how they want to be identified, and, and, and they're, the, it's just like a very different lens than, than people who grew up with different, a different set of assumptions. And so I think that's where, if there's a conflict, it's just not having uh, the same kind of lens and, and looking at the exact same social issue of like what land or what parts of the ocean belong to who. And yeah, and, and I think the, the weird thing is as Americans, we're kind of like everything belongs to us, <laughs> like commercially or culturally or whatever. So Christine and others, you know, you talked about Asian, oops, Asian American, specific, it's not a monolith, but yet that's constructed both nationally and internationally. And so why do we have these terms if they don't really work all the time <laughs> or don't work some of the time in some situations, but yet why do we adopt these terms? Why do they become part of a committee or a commission? Why do they become a label for a student program? Why do they become a functional identity? Um, what utilities and pitfalls of those utilities do we have when we think about Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, for instance? <laughs> well, I think um, most AAPI individuals usually identify with their particular cultural group first, and then AAPI, and, and that's totally reasonable, and so that's kind of a downfall. I see myself as Filipina, I don't see myself as AAPI. But we were talking about a little bit about this concept of invisibility and lack of student activism or even lack of Asian American political engagement. I think many of us grew up and were told to, to remain invisible. Don't cause trouble, um, don't speak up, um, just focus and don't draw any attention to yourself. Especially for Asian American women, it was like the last thing that you would do is cause trouble. and so. If anything, that is something that binds us all together, is this immigrant kind of experience, work ethic. Whether you've been here for generations or recently arrived, it's this feeling where don't cause trouble. And so, it, you know, for Simon, it's a, it's a great example. Um, but the pitfall of that is that we do make ourselves invisible. And that when um, there are serious issues that happen in terms of hate crimes, bias incidents, mass shootings, and things like that, it's, you know, we don't know how to galvanize as a community sometimes. Um, we don't know how to have a collective response to these issues. And in, so, in some ways, it's kind of like the other communities drawing attention to it that give it power. So we need to, um, I think it's about revitalizing, again, like I said, generating that um, common identity so that we can advocate uh, for collective issues. Obviously, we're not a monolithic group. We have very conservative Asians and very liberal Asians, but there are some things that I think, especially around hate, that um, we can galvanize around. One issue, for example, is uh, mental health. Um, Asian American communities tend to be, um, they don't talk openly about mental health issues, and I think following the pandemic, we're kind of in the midst of this uh, mental health crisis for an entire generation. And I was just speaking with counseling and psychological services, and they're just trying to draw Asian American students in. They're, it's the most underrepresented group in terms of um, the utilization of those resources. So while at the same time we grow up feeling like we are invisible, sometimes we actually make ourselves more invisible and we don't seek out those supports. So for those of us who are older, many of you who are activists, um, you know, growing up or as adults, it's really incumbent on us um, to help the younger generation sort of understand that. But the hopeful piece is that um, I really do think through art um, and this collective sense of, um, you know, the universal experience, you know, everybody talks about everything everywhere all at once. It wasn't an Asian or Chinese movie, it was an American movie. And I think the reason why it resonated with so many people is because there was this universal sense of the challenges, the struggles that everybody goes through. And whether it's movies or music, sometimes those are the things that um, can really bring a community together. I mean, I did not have any of those things growing up. Um, so seeing my daughters really excited to watch a K-pop band and learn the dance and be like really present in their bodies and feel it. In some ways they're learning that from Asian culture, like 
actual Asian culture to see people come out and be brash and be themselves, whether you know they're a performer, um, a writer, an author. And I think there are just so many more opportunities now to use art. And I know that's a piece for you, Dean Williams, that you, we can use art and theater and all of those things to bring people together. I think that's just a, a great opportunity. And, and Simon is just such a, he embodies that spirit in terms of activism, troublemaking, art. It just brings all of that together. So um, we are, of course, an educational institution, which includes the performing of visual arts and uh, ethnic studies and social behavioral sciences and a broad range of the humanities. So Ed, talk to us about what's been going on in the classroom over your 31 years. Not so much about the student experience. I think you could talk to us like, what did, you, what did you expect? What did you ask the students to read in 1992, 1993? And what are you asking them to read and grapple with now in terms of curriculum? in Asian American studies, you know, in terms of what are the major themes, what are the major problems that they should be learning about, what's basic knowledge, what's, you know, what's far out there, but you know, what would you imagine the future of Asian American studies should look like? Yeah, I'm a firm believer of uh, history. Uh, one needs to learn uh, their own history, and unfortunately, the majority of uh, Asian American students don't know their own history. So Ethnic Studies 5 is intro to Asian American Studies. And I call that uh, Asian American Dating 101. Uh, they get to meet their future spouses, too. You know, it's a large class, you know, 150, 200 students. Well, you mean actual, not just dating the material, but dating each other? Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm teaching uh, right now Asian American Studies uh, right now, and I give a talk on Angel Island uh, the other day, and some students were in tears. Uh, you know, they really didn't understand, didn't know anything about the uh, history of Angel Island, how Asian immigrants, Chinese Im immigrants in particular, were detained, whereas European immigrants landing in Ellis Island, Statue of Liberty, they, they went through. It, they simply did a medical examination and they were admitted into the United States. Whereas Chinese immigrants, they were detained between three days uh, to up to three years until you can prove your identity. The purpose of Angel Island was to detain, to regulate, to exclude Asian immigrants, uh, which is totally opposite of Ellis Island. So we, but in school, they teach about Ellis Island but they do not teach about Angel Island because it's anything but American. It's a, you know, America is supposed to be a land of freedom, land of immigrant, and yet Angel Island was land uh, uh, totally opposite of what we believe in, what we teach in classroom. So I, you know, emphasize about history, historical evolution, and how Asian American, you asked about the term Asian American, uh, was gave rise in 1968. Before 1968, we were called Orientals. And Oriental is like an equivalent of N-word. And yet, old people, old generations still use Oriental term quite often. It's legacy of a colonialism, is an imperialism, is a Eurocentric term. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, Asian American, meant the federal government didn't want to deal with all these ethnic specific groups. So they lumped everyone into Asian American. But Asian American students in 1960s decided to redefine who they are based on their own term. So they made it, you know, activism, social justice. So Asian American, the term carries uh, equality and justice and uh, historical legacy trying to identify themselves as the Asian Americans. So when I teach all this, the students will light up there and they will and try to link uh, current events to historical events. So that's how they should be aware of what is going on. It didn't happen out of you know, blue. It, it, it's not random. It's that we have a long history of anti-Asian, uh, particularly here in California. So they need to understand where we are, we you really need to have historical consciousness, historical understanding 
of uh, how we got here. I think that's what I emphasize the most. As a historian, I can endorse that. So let's um, invite questions. I don't know uh, if those of you who might want to stand and to speak loudly, or I can come down and offer a microphone. Oh, we have a microphone coming right now. A question. The, the relation between my art and my activism. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so for a very l large part of my career, probably longer than I wish for, I used to think of them as separate things. Like, here's the art side. I'm, I play music and, and that sort of thing. And here's the activism side. Like, maybe we'll do a, a fundraiser. Maybe we'll work on an anti-bullying campaign or something like that. Um, but I thought, I thought of them as, like, two different hats. And I started realizing more and more that it, in many ways the two were tied together. Like whether it's a marching in the streets or it's the backbeat of drums, like it's still expression and, and using that expression to drive social change. And one of my um, favorite political writers is Eric Liu, who's the founder of uh, Citizen University. He says, a culture is upstream of policy, and, and I strongly believe that, that you oftentimes need to change hearts and minds in order to have uh, sustainable policies. And so I didn't realize it at the time that we were actually working on both fronts, like the, the culture aspect as well as the political uh, front, especially as we started getting into things like um, you know advocating for passing legislation or in our case, you know, went to, to the Supreme Court and, and, and since then have continued on um, filing briefs at the Supreme Court and, and, and other state legislatures to, to try and drive change. So I, I think that like um, one of the th things that, that as we were kind of discussing is like sometimes it's difficult for students to find what it is that they, or, or their place in it. Maybe it's because culturally we're taught to be invisible. But I think it's also maybe there's just people don't understand how to create change. And they're afraid that if they stand up uh, that it won't actually work. We have to show them that it is possible. And, and I know through the work of my foundation now, we're, we're mentoring, we're funding artistic projects that uh, drive civic engagement. I'm like, it is working. We're, we're seeing folks actually step up, and art is oftentimes just a really great entry point because there people can see themselves in it. And as the, and the more that they can see themselves, the more that they have those mirrors, the more they realize that that's a possibility of who they are as a as as a whole being. And I think being able to live into that expressive activist activist part of ourselves is a, an important part of the journey to understand to, uh, who we are as as people. John, um, Doug, could you, oh, yeah, John. Um, Simon, I was wondering if you could take us through the story of your legal battles. I know it has something to do with the name of your band, but I don't quite understand what the issue was and how it played out. So maybe you could tell us that story. Sure, I'll give you like a quick like Cliff Notes version. We, we actually are, we have a whole thing about it tomorrow night. Uh, but uh, the, the long and short of it is that uh, when I tried to apply for a trademark, tried to register my band name as a trademark, the government denied it. And they said it was because our name was disparaging or racist to Asian people. Uh, we fought for years and, and, and thousands of our community members actually stepped up, many orgs and and, and experts and leaders uh, tried to fight with us, but the government said it, that our voice was not good enough because uh, they wanted to use evidence like UrbanDictionary.com and other wiki joke websites, uh, and thinking that that actually had more credibility than our ourselves. Um, so we continued to appeal, and eight years later, we found ourselves before the Supreme Court of the United States, where we ended up uh, fighting for uh, challenging the 70 year old law uh, un under uh, f you say basically arguing that it was abridging our f freedom of expression, our First Amendment rights. 
and, and that's where we eventually did did win. But along the way, learned a whole lot about the First Amendment and obscure trademark laws written in the 1930s. And and so and, and for us, it was also like bringing attention, like not only to our struggle but that of all communities that wanted to choose for ourselves. Like we, we, we said it shouldn't be up to the government, it should be to our, up to our communities to decide what's best for ourselves. And so that, that was kind of the, um, the big thing that we were fighting for. Sorry? How was it funded? The, the uh, so it, it was funded by uh, originally, uh, the, well, I'll, I'll say about 18 months into the battle, our legal representation was very generous and decided to do it pro bono. We were responsible for hard fees, court fees, research, filing fees. There are many, many fees, I'll just say this. Uh, uh, so in the middle of this, I actually walked away from being a full-time musician to take on a bunch of side jobs to pay for all those things. And uh, towards the end, started doing fundraisers, crowdfunding, and, and that sort of thing. And then um, when we are at the Supreme Court where the fees get even higher, like if you wanna make photocopies and have them stapled, the court only allows a handful of printers in the country uh, that are authorized to do this. Uh, you can't just go to Staples. And so that's where printing fees are like 15 to $30,000 per set of uh, documents. Um, a couple of foundations were very generous and stepped in and, and helped with that part of it. So, um, yeah, it was, it was very tough for a minute. I almost lost my house. <laughs> my band fell apart for, for a few years. But uh, I, I think it just goes to show that oftentimes the systems we have in place aren't designed for, uh, to accommodate for communities that are traditionally under-resourced. Uh, but, but that was also a big part of why I want to fight for it, to say, like, you know, um, we need to do better. Just on the same subject, uh, if if a non-Asian band used that name, what, what would they say? Is that good, no good, or what do you think? Uh, so um, it was actually suggested by the government that if it was a group comprised of Caucasians, it wouldn't be an issue. So when we asked them, like, because the, the, the trademark uh, office actually had hundreds, almost 800 trademarks f with uh, the word slant in it. We're like, well, what's the difference between slanted records and Slant Shack and The Slants. And they said that we were too Asian to use the mark. That, that when people looked at us, they would assume it is a racial slur instead of any other definition, uh, which is just another way of saying anyone who is not Asian can use this. And then when we started digging into this more, we found out that any racial slur you could think of for an Asian person was a registered trademark except when Asian people applied, they were excluded from it. And then, um, and then if you kind of move beyond that and you think like, who are the types of people that reappropriate language? It's gonna be women, people of color, and members of the LGBTQ community. We found the same pattern, that um, women who are reappropriating terms that were oftentimes used to uh, objectify them uh, were, were rejected, but, uh, pornographic companies had a whole bunch, like thousands and thousands of registrations. So um, it just kind of went to show like who got the benefit of the doubt, tended to be pe people from dominant groups and people with resources. Just one more question for Simon. If you don't mind, uh, what did your, uh, what kind of um, your parents' background, how did they feel when you decided to go into this field, uh, you know? How did my parents feel? Uh, they were not thrilled. <laughs> they, they kept asking me to get a real job. <laughs> and, and like, when are you gonna quit music and, and, and do something? Um, they, they just had a very difficult time understanding like how a person could have a sustainable living making art. And then uh, when I was like, well, now I'm doing marketing. And they're like, we don't know what that is. But that doesn't sound like a, a sustainable thing either. <laughs> did, you, uh, do you, did you find that your parents also identified you as a troublemaker? Yeah. Did you identify yeah, yourself? Yes. And, and so my dad actually left China as a political refugee. And he was like, if you keep making trouble, they're going to put you in jail. 
like, especially as I was fighting the government. And I was like, Dad, if they do that, they're going to be even more trouble. Like, I will like, freak out here and, and really rain it down. Uh, because they, they, they just, they didn't understand. And I was like, no, we have constitutional rights in this country. And, I, and it wasn't until 2017, uh, after we had won at the Supreme Court, uh, that... Um, my mom calls me up and, and she's like, oh, you're on the Chinese newspaper. Like there's a, the, the most widely printed Chinese newspaper uh, here in the States. And I was like, yeah, I've been telling you, it's like a big deal. <laughs> and they're like, no, you're on the front page of the newspaper. And then I, I found out later that day, my dad drove around to every international market buying copies of this thing, saying, that's my son. And, and, and so that was the first time in a very long time that uh, that I heard the words, I'm proud of you. I, if, I, if I read your, your memoir correctly, the irony is, is that you don't read Chinese, right? I don't read Chinese. So this, you have this artifact, this, this archival register, which is very meaningful for your parents, and of course meaningful for you, but in a very different way. You have to access it through their language skills and reading, so. Yeah, I have to use like my Google Translate to figure out what it actually <laughs> says. And I'm like, is it actually accurate? <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's just a, a trip when you think about the, 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 all these different cultural barriers, language barriers, and, and perceptions and assumptions that come with our various identities. Do we have maybe time for one more question? Yes, please. Hey, I'm really enjoying this panel. I'm really glad you all are here tonight. Um, I'm Deborah Wong from the UCR Music Department, and um, I'd love to hear each of you tell us a bit about how, if you do, <laughs> how you came to think of yourselves as Asian American as, as opposed to what other, other identifications you may have, such as Taiwanese American. And, and the way I usually sort of go at this, and I know each of you has a very different story, and that's what I want to hear. Um, I, I usually sort of go at it as, you know, like, um, I'm multi-ethnic, third-generation Chinese-American, but I'm 110% Asian-American. You know, I mean, it's kind of my shorthand way of going at it. And I'd love to hear each of you just briefly tell us a bit about that journey towards the Asian-American identity. Well, I was, I was an immigrant. I, I had to learn English language from when I was 18 years old, and I did not speak any words of English when I arrived in LAX in 1970s. And so I struggled, and I, I, I was 18 years old, and I, my plan was to go to high school for a year and learn and go to college. But they say I was adult, 18 years old, so I cannot go to uh, high school. So my plan derailed, and I decided to be all I can be. I enlisted in the army uh, to learn English language. And so I learned F word, the first word that I learned, and I did not know what it meant. It took me a month to figure out what, the, what it meant, F word. Because they, they say, what is your name? They don't say that. What, what the F were your name? Every other sentence had that F word in the army. So, it took me a long time, a month, to figure it out. But anyway, uh, after I, I honorably discharged, I, I went to community college for two years and transferred to Cal Berkeley, fortunately. It was easy to get in back then to Cal Berkeley, and I was a sociology major. But when I took a classes, I, they were teaching Kant, Marx, you know, all these you know, philosophers, I couldn't understand what it meant and what they were talking about, but fortunately at Cal, they had the Asian American Studies Department and teaching Asian American classes. And I was, my eyes lit up. It's all about my story. And that's how I got in to Asian American Studies. I just barely took enough courses to graduate in sociology, but I, I think I took more Asian American Studies classes than sociology. And then I went on to UCLA master's program in uh, Asian American studies. Uh, when I was about to finish my master's, uh, Berkeley announced nation's first PhD program in ethnic studies. 
So I applied and I became one of the first eight students that were admitted to nation's first PhD program in ethnic studies. And UCR hired me even before I finished, so I'm here. There it is, it's history, right? <laughs> I mean, for me, most of my life growing up as a kid, I was Chinese and Taiwanese. I, I didn't really live into the Asian American identity until I started an all Asian band. And that's when I started learning the political significance of what an Asian American, uh, like what, what that label meant. Like it was more than just like trying to like reach for some generic version of like an ethnic identifier. I was like, this is a political identity. And it was actually young folks that taught me about it. Like we, when we, we launched, we launched as an Asian dance rock band. And um, kids would write me on myspace.com, which is where we launched. So like, it's an old band. Like, and, and they would, and they would kept calling us an Asian American band. And I was like, well, what's the difference? It, you know, like, like what, and that's when I started really learning about it. And so in many ways, our, our evolution as artists, activists, as Asian Americans kind of grew from, from my experiences in music and, 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 and that, that, that became my own entry point, and then I kind of hit the ground running from there. And, and you know, thankfully, there was like very, very great resources like Angry Asian Man, Phil Yu, uh, Reappropriate. There's like all these figures who are in the blogosphere who are writing about it. And, and I was like, I, I guess kind of like what you're saying here, like, you're like, that's my story. That's how I identify with. So uh, that's how I jumped into the like, kind of Asian American label. Uh, for me, I guess once I started college, uh, I considered myself Filipino American. Well, growing up, I was just Filipino, and then got to college, it was Filipino American because I was part of a huge Filipino American club at UC Irvine, uh, and considered myself just Filipino American. And it wasn't until I got hired here at UCR and started working at Asian Pacific Student Programs that I realized, okay, I'm also Asian American. Uh, but I think this goes back to kind of what Christine was saying earlier. It, you identify with the group that you kind of uh, connect with. So, so I think maybe if I was somewhere in, you know, in the Midwest where there isn't a large population of Filipino Americans, then maybe I would have considered myself Asian American sooner, uh, just because there wasn't a, a critical mass, but being in Southern California and uh, there being Filipino American community, Chinese American community, Korean American community, like I think it's easier for uh, for myself and for my students, or our, the students at UCR, to identify with their specific ethnic group versus considering themselves Asian American. But uh, obviously when, uh, when there are uh, issues or, or uh, things that we need to mobilize around, I think that's when it, uh, students then start to consider themselves Asian American uh, versus their specific ethnic group. But uh, I think that's at least how I got into, uh, you know, considering myself Asian American was, wasn't until I started working at APSP and realized, all right, well, I can't just represent the Filipinos on campus. I got to re represent all the Asians and start cons considering it's myself your job, Asian right? American. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm not actually American. I'm Canadian. And I have not gotten my American citizenship, even though I've lived here for um, just over 20 years. Um, I was born in Canada. My parents were born in the Philippines. Um, when I was doing my PhD at UC Santa Barbara, I, I needed to make some extra money, so I TA'd in the Asian American Studies Department uh, with Professor John Park, and that's when I learned about the, the history, Asian American history, and that was the first time I saw myself and my family's story come to life, hearing about uh, Filipino farm workers, um, Filipino nurses coming, um, chain migration, all of those different things, and that was really truly a, the moment where I felt this is my story, and I guess I'll just end. It was the UC um, that inspired me to to embrace my um, identity as an Asian American. Wow, what a nice place to st to kind of close out. UCR logo behind us. Uh, I want to give a shout out to, of course, our panelists here. Everyone in University Communications, the Press Enterprise, and KUCR who are getting the word out about uh, Simon's visit, which we've just had a wonderful um, introduction to, and that will continue tomorrow, uh, noon to two. There'll be a concert at the Bell Tower. Headliner is the Slants. 
who haven't performed much together recently, if I heard that, did I? Correct, Correct. okay, this, so. This is the first time you'll perform. Okay, so this, okay, that's uh, this version of the slants new. Uh, there'll be a welcoming ceremony by the UCR Tycho Ensemble and an opening act, and I think it's their, if Jeff can correct me, their first public performance of a UCR student band studies of the Star Cross. So that's tomorrow noon to two at the Bell Tower. And then the afternoon, uh, really in the evening, early evening at the University Theater, Simon will be speaking um, uh, about his work, about his journey. Uh, that's again in the University Theater, 5.30 to 7.30. We'll have some performance and we'll have some talking, okay? And um, uh, also he'll be available to sign uh, copies of his memoir, which will be for sale. For those of you who are concerned, where am I going to park? You can park in lot six, blue lot. You can park for free. You can park for free. Uh, so again, tomorrow noon, Bell Tower concert, and then in the, uh, in the early evening at the University Theater. So before I invite you all to um, take in some more refreshments, converse among yourselves and with our panelists here, if you do have time, it's a pleasure to invite you to walk next door to see the California Museum of Photography's exhibition, CM P at 50, 50 years uh, of work in photography and photographic technologies for the California Museum of Photography, which is documenting, collecting, curator, curating, working, uh, exhibiting, and uh, engaging the community around photography. Special to us, and I think um, Jeff will play this. Oh, Jeff, am I doing this on my, my clicker? Here. Um, there's a very brief thing. These are images here. Oops, you know, slideshow. I'll go back here. Oh, oh well. Oops, I messed up. I'm sorry. You can see the real thing. Uh, thanks to Doug and uh, his team, they pulled some work from the archives, uh, from the photographic archives for a couple different works from the California Museum of Photography's collection, which feature um, some familiar and also some different advantages on the Asian American Pacific Islander experience. And so you'll be able to see the originals right next door. We've had a little interactive work with this, with this stereographic glasses as well. There we go, right there. Uh, and um, again, to think more about the different technologies, the various kinds of ways of documentation, and the different possibilities of Asian immigration and Asian American communities in the United States. So that being said, I want to thank our panelists very much for their presence here, for their contributions, for telling their stories, for being with us in community. I want to thank you all for being here. Look forward to seeing you over the next two days. Thank you. <laughs>